Hey, everybody. Honored to be here. And we got a real special night in store for you. Super thrilled to be here uh, with my friend and his awesome new book, Manhood, Senator Josh Hawley. Let me just say something here before I uh, hand it to the senator. This is one of the most important issues happening in America. Uh, well, it's it not it's not happening enough, which is the development of young male leaders. In fact, we have a men's summit now at Turning Point USA. And this really is in some ways kind of like the third rail. You're not allowed to say that you know, masculinity is not what it used to be. So I'm honored to be included here tonight. We're going to have a great conversation. Also, take your questions. Uh, I'm going to read the back of the book because I think this is beautiful. All is not well with men in America, and that spells trouble for the American Republic. These are troubled times, but trouble may lead to renewal. The possibility of something better for men, for America, awaits us. I think that there's a very special opportunity for us to talk about it and do something about it and raise men of this next generation. And Senator Hawley is with us. Senator, how you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. So congratulations on the book. How's it going so far? Any adversarial media? Any uh, <laughs> you going on MSNBC? Oh, of course. Joe of had you course. on yet? Of course there is. There's got to be, right? If you're not making them angry, then you're not doing something right. So absolutely, because you, you hit the nail on the head. We're not supposed to talk about masculinity. I mean, that's like the absolutely forbidden. No, absolutely do not mention that. So uh, the left is totally melting down. Every time we mention it on social media, they completely lose their minds. It is wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. So I, I can't wait. I really hope you can get on Morning Joe and have a debate about masculinity with Joe Scarborough. I think <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, or how about Chris Hayes? Chris yeah. Hayes is not exactly the face of, <laughs> of American masculinity. So he's some, based on something else, and eh, androgynous metrosexualism. All right, so let's talk about the book, and then we're going to get to some questions here, Senator. I'm going to re-ask the question I asked on our show, our yeah. podcast, which is, you're a senator, you know, you're trying to rein in big tech, close our border. Why masculinity? I mean, usually when senators write books, it's either kind of ghost-written books to run for the presidency or about some policy idea. You you decided to go a different way. Why this topic? Well, and I, I wrote every word here, so I just say to people, like, if you're offended... It, it's me. It's all me. So, and if you're offended, maybe you need to read it again, you know? Um, so, and if you're offended by all of the Bible content in here, then maybe you should go and read the Bible too. Um, no, listen, the, the real reason that I did this, Charlie, and I talk about this in the book some, is that I've got three little kids at home. As you know, you've met my boys and my two oldest are 10 and eight. They're both boys. And for me, it was really thinking about what my obligation is to them as a dad, as a father. How do I help them grow to be the men that God made them to be, to be the men that this country needs them to be. And so the book really came out of that. And I even say at the end of the book that it's really an open letter to my sons, you know, and I, I hope that I hope that when they read it one day uh, that it will mean something to them. But it's really me as a father thinking through what does it mean to be a man of integrity? What's it mean to be a strong man, a good man? And so I wrote it for my sons with that in mind. So, you know, in, in the book, you talk about the problem and then some solution. But I, I want to solutions. I want to ask. You know, it's definitely gotten worse over the last twenty or thirty years. It getting worse being the decline of kind of the masculine archetype. You know, as where, where where have the men gone? Why do you think that is? What is it? Is it our industrial policy? Is it something in pop culture media? Is it all? Is it just kind of a really mess of a combination of events? Is it so? Is it? left-wing social pressures that through activist groups like what why is this happened because it, it's it's beyond troubling it's civilizational ending it yeah it is and i think and you're I think you're exactly right it has gotten worse i think a couple things i think the pressure from the left the social pressure from the left to talk about this in the book i mean the left now doesn't believe in manhood they don't believe in womanhood they don't believe in gender at all and so we've seen an all-out assault that has been going on for years but really built to a crescendo in the last let's say five years an all-out assault on the idea of anything permanent, anything eternal, anything that connects us to God. And so I, I think you see as part of that this crusade against manhood. And you see it taught in our schools from the time that our boys are little. You see men relentlessly told that to be a man is a bad thing, that if you are a man, you are going to contribute to the destruction of civilization, that masculinity is inherently toxic. This has just become gospel on the left, and they push it everywhere. Entertainment, the media for sure, uh, and even sometimes even in sports messaging now we're getting this. So I think that that has been building and building part of the left's assault on, again, on things that are true and good and permanent. And then you mentioned industrial policy. 
that's a piece of it, Charlie, that people don't like to talk about, especially not Washington, because nobody wants to take any responsibility. But the truth is that for 30, 40 years now, the so-called experts in Washington have shipped away so many jobs, good paying blue collar jobs that men used to perform and support a family on. And today it's tougher and tougher to support a family on one income in this country, especially blue collar income. That is devastating this country. And we need to reverse that. I um, I think there's a desire and an appetite to fix this. And I think it, it, it manifests in a lot of different ways. For example, the rise of stoic literature. Uh, there's YouTube channels that are talking about this. I, I want to read this because this definitely got my attention. How many senators do you think can tell you what Epicurean philosophy is? Because I, <laughs> I, I happen to have read um, Epicureanism and I find it to be awful. Um, in fact, I think it's actually the root of a lot of self-indulgence. And so you said you two concepts of liberty. This is how this Epicurean concept works out in the end. It is bread and circus for the people, the working men and women of the country now rendered faceless and voiceless by liberal policies separated from family, from work, from church and from home and power for the elite who will busily continue deconstructing American society to make the common person dependent on them. That's beautifully written. Talk about I mean, we don't we don't have to go too deep into the philosophy, of it, but I think it's interesting. Who, what is Epicureanism and how does it tie to kind of the modern view of the self? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I think that modern liberalism is basically Epicurean, by which I just mean the self is God. Yes. Pleasure is God. Self-indulgence is God. So they don't really believe in much of anything. They don't believe in eternity. They don't believe in heaven or hell. They don't believe in God. Uh, they don't believe in male or female, the modern left. What they do believe in is pleasure. And so they say, listen, the universe is a meaningless place. That's correct. We're all just kind of stuck in it. So what do we do? Do our best. Make yourself happy. You know, I mean, just that's the most we can do. Make yourself happy and don't interfere with anybody else who's trying to make themselves happy. Then that's basically the message of the left today. And the message to men, if we want to distill that down a little bit more, is why don't you go sit in front of a screen and watch whatever entertains you, order a bunch of stuff, you know, be a consumer, be an androgynous consumer. Yeah, that's that's right. basically the left's message to men. And if a man wants to be more than that, they say, oh, no, that's you are co contributing to the systemic injustice of America. You know, I mean, that's America is a terrible place because of you men, because of what you've done. And so men get this message constantly. Just it's bread and circuses, as I say in the book and the quote that you read. The left's message to them is just be entertained. We'll run the country. You know, we leftists will run the country. You men, you sit down, shut up. Yes. Watch something on, on your screen, buy some stuff, sit in your cubicle, don't rock the boat. And I think, Charlie, what we need to say to a generation of men who want more than that, right? You see this every day. This is what you do. You work with young people. Men and women want so much more than that. And our message to them needs to be, no, turn off the screen. Get out of your parents' basement. Go get a job. Go date a woman, men. Go marry a woman, even better. Go start a family and change the world. That's how you change the world, is by sacrificing yes. self, not making self your God. Yeah, and and as we talked about on my our podcast, going on the journey of Genesis 12, which is to leave your father's home, you're going to get beat up a little bit. But so so let's talk about the word your the two words that I think are missing for most young men that I know you talk about in the book. By the way, everyone go get your book right now, premiercollectibles.com slash manhood. Senator, it's obligation and duty. Mm. Th those are two words that if you ask most men, what are you obligated to and to whom do you have a duty or to what, you know, the divine? They'd say, well, what are you talking about? I, I mean, I, Chipotle, Uber Eats, you know, uh, video game. Why, why do those two words matter and how did we lose sight of them? I think they matter because they tell us who we are. You know, we are defined by our duties and our obligations. And as a man, the ability, the call on your life to sacrifice yourself for other people, to sacrifice yourself for the woman you love, to sacrifice yourself for the children you may father. And whether you're a father or a husband yet or not, to sacrifice yourself for the good of other people around you who need you at a very fundamental level, that call to sacrifice self is really what it means to be a man, I think. I mean, the journey to manhood is a journey to character, right? And it's one that we never, we never stop. I mean, we pursue it our whole life long trying to grow in character. So, you know, to me, duty obligation defines at a real core of what makes us men. And also, Charlie, what gives us purpose in life, right? I think this is why so many men 
living in this culture don't feel a sense of purpose. What purpose is there in entertainment and being entertained? I mean, what purpose is there in being an androgynous consumer? There's no purpose in that. No, and 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 that's why we're seeing suicide rates and depression right. rates the way they are. This is the most important part of the book, in my opinion. And I'm so, I mean, you independently are talking about stuff that have, I've made kind of core ethos. You say, you, you, you quote Genesis 1-1, which is, if you believe in Genesis 1-1, therefore, everything you do has a purpose. Yes. If you don't believe in Genesis 1-1, then it may or may not have a purpose. You say this, the world was a chaotic place at first, no day and night, no land and sky, no order. So no distinctions, right? right. Very, very important. That's why they need to get rid of the distinction of male and female. Just the deep and the ancient symbol of chaos ever churning, the form and in darkness, disorder itself. There are many creation stories in the Near East. Most of them begin with chaos and darkness, followed by an account of how the first gods emerge from it out of the deep, not so in Genesis. That is true. It is a unique creation story. But talk about, you know, as America has become more secular, then people struggle to find purpose. Is it possible in a secular society to be able to have objective meaning and purpose? I, 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 str I struggle to believe so. Well, I have to say that the experiment in that, that the left has wanted to run for going on 50 years now, which is basically to try to erase faith from the public sphere, to erase God and eternity from the public sphere, I don't think is going so well. Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, I, I believe in liberty of conscience, but that's because I am a Christian. I mean, as a Christian, I believe in the right of conscience that, that God speaks to the conscience and every person has to have the right to follow him as they see fit. But it is it is grounded in faith. Right. So to your point. If you take that out, if you take out the God of the Bible, if you take out any sense of eternity and meaning, then, you know, I think I think it's pretty hard to say, well, what is it I'm supposed to do with my life? And that's why in the book, what I do is, is look back at the stories of the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say? What, what guides does it give us about what it means to be a good man, what it means to be a strong man, what it means to have a sense of purpose in life? And you nailed it right there when you were we were reading from Genesis 1. I mean, it sets it out. I mean, what, is, what does God do? He creates order. He creates flourishing. He then calls us to follow in his footsteps and do the same. So there it is, real simple for men. What are you supposed to do with your life? Right there. You're supposed to co-labor with God, work with God to make the world what it could be, to bring beauty, to bring order, to bring liberty, right? That's our mission as men. So... Let's go through some examples. If you were to say to your son or to a young man, what would be an example of a man of a man uh, worth worth emulating or a, a heroic man, a biblical or otherwise? Uh, give, give some examples. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with a biblical one and uh, and then I'll give one from American history. So a biblical one who I talk about in the book is uh, King David. You know, I mean, he arguably Israel's greatest king, also a guy full of flaws. You know, this is the thing, Charlie, that I find so hopeful. I mean, every man out there knows this, right? None of us are perfect. So let's just be clear about that. If the journey to manhood is a journey to perfection, then I'm certainly not getting there. None of us are getting there, right? But what is hopeful about the stories of the Bible and the call to manhood as character is it's something we can get better at every day. It's something that we can grow in. So David, not a perfect guy, but yet he leaves an incredible legacy. Why? Because he was willing to give his life for God. He was willing to give his life as a warrior for others. He was willing to use his authority for good and to lay down his own interests, to sacrifice his interests for the good of other people. And it made him the greatest king of the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament. Uh, just amazing. There's one example, heroic. Um, I hope my boys, you know, I, I hope that they will want to be, grow up and be like, man, I want to be like King David. And yeah, he had a lot of flaws. But guess what? God was able to use him despite those flaws. It's amazing. From American history, you know I love this guy, Charlie. I love Theodore Roosevelt, and I quote him in the book several times. Again, not a perfect guy at all. We could pick apart some of his policies. I've done that in other settings. But I think you look at Roosevelt, and here's a guy who loved his country, loved his family, was committed to his faith, and his whole life long, he was about service, he was about sacrifice, and he was about challenging the men of his generation to step up and answer the call. And Charlie, he, he really, he changed the generation with his example, not an example of perfection, but his example of encouragement and vision for people's lives. And I just think he is a great American and we still remember him today because of his character. And I, he's somebody who I've, I hope to emulate and uh, I hope my boys will want to too. So I, I want to ask you to speculate here 
and I know this is tough. What, what, if you were a leftist, why do you need to remove men? What, what, what is it about masculinity that is at odds with a totalitarian Marxist agenda? Uh, is it, is, if you were to, and I'm get I'm getting closer towards, you know, just being blunt about the question, which is, is this intentional? Is it not? It's impossible to know, but I, I certainly think part of it is. But what is it about masculinity that is so disagreeable with the tyrant? I th- men stand in the way, I think. You know, I mean, an independent man who says, hold on, no, I'm not, I'm not just going to do what I'm told. I'm going to do what I believe is right. I'm, I'm going to, we talked about duty and obligation. I'm going to put that first. I'm not going to just do what, what some guy in government or some elite tells me to do. I'm going to defend my family. I'm going to defend my neighborhood. I'm going to stand up for my church. Those kind of men, I think, are threatening to an elite regime that wants to call the shots, that wants to run the country. Here's been the message of our elites, Charlie, for the last 30, 40, 50 years, really since mid-century. It has been, hey, let us run the country. We're experts. You know, We should have a government of experts. And who are the experts? We are. The liberals are. So we'll run the country. You people... Go buy some stuff. Go buy some cheap stuff from China, you know, and otherwise shut up and let us run the country. And I think a man who is independent economically, morally, spiritually is a threat to that because that kind of a man says, hold on. No, this is a this is a self-governing republic. I, I think maybe I'll run my own life. Thanks. And I think maybe I want to have a voice in my government. Thank you. Those kind of men, I think, are a threat. And so you see the left trying to placate them, trying to get rid of them, trying to turn us into androgynous consumers. So the uh, the population of people that seem to resonate with this the most are women. And I don't know if you agree or not, but we have a young women's leadership summit that we do. And we, we have over 2,500 young ladies that attend. And overwhelmingly, they're telling us can't find men that have their act together. All the men I know have you know no self-control, no responsibility. They act like women. And you know, I, I, there's men that want this as well. That I mean, like, want this mantra for their life, this commitment. And we saw this with the rise of Jordan Peterson, yeah. and you know his his beautiful work and his contribution to this. I mean, but what does it say when women are the ones that are receptive? Because you could you could probably not understanding the moment we're in, you'd say, oh well, you know, it's going to be women that are they're going to be the harshest critics of the book. I mean, I was flipping through some of the nastiest articles written about the book, which are hilarious, are by men. Not by women. Your thoughts, Senator? Well, I think it's because strong women don't want to have another child in the house who they have to drag along and provide for, right? I was talking about this with my wife, you know, and and she's like, listen, women aren't stupid. They they don't want to marry a guy who, what is he going to contribute? Nothing. You know, what's she going to do with him? She's going to have to treat him like one of the babies. They don't want that. And so I think that, you know, strength Strength plays off of strength, right? I mean, the Bible says in, in a different context that that men, two strong men, sharpen each other like iron on iron. That's I can say from my own experience with, with my wife and my marriage, two strong people sharpen one another. And so I think it's it's totally understandable that women are like, listen, guys, I mean, I, I don't are you gonna contribute or not? You know, I need you to be a contributor here. I mean, I need yeah. you to be part of what we're doing in this family. And Charlie, the stats bear this out. Like you wanna address the problem of childhood poverty in America, put a father back into the home. You want to address the problem of youth violence, which is spiraling out of control in this country, put a father into the lives of these young men. So really, it is it is men stepping up and doing what they're capable of doing. And I think, yeah, women want that because they don't want to have to carry the burden by themselves. And it's like, hey, men, come on. I mean, we need you. And listen, I believe in the complementarity of, of men and women. I mean, we're different. That's wonderful. There's distinctions. That's beautiful. You put them together. It's powerful. And I think that women women get that. Strong women get that. And so I, I want to get to some questions here, um, some really important ones. I, I just I'm curious, ha- have any of your colleagues commented on, on you writing this book yet? I, I mean, just legislatively or is this kind of just not are they more worried about sending money to Zelensky or something? <laughs> Well, that is a passion of theirs. Yes. Um, I, I will say a couple of people have mentioned it, particularly uh, folks who are who are fellow believers. Oh, good. And have said like, yeah, you know, I l- love the love the fact that you're wanting to talk about the Bible um, and and talk about faith and its significance. So so that's awesome. But I will just say this, and this is not to a comment on any of my colleagues, but I just think of DC in general. I mean, listen, I haven't 
been in D.C. for very long, but it's long enough to figure out that this town has absolutely no idea what its 30 and 40 and 50 year long policy of destroying the working class in this country, destroying blue collar men. They have no idea what they've done and they don't have any idea how to fix it. I mean, they still want to keep doing the same old things, keep sending the jobs away. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a week I have people say, oh, well, but it's good to have cheap stuff from overseas. And if we lose some jobs in the process, you know, ah. yeah, it's, it's good for McKinsey. I mean, exactly. look, strong men are a threat to neoliberalism, right? right? Strong men, you have robust industrial policy. You don't need to have unlimited amounts of foreigners in your country. And you have strong men that do not have to have this weird fetish to go invade every sovereign country every five years and then bankrupt our country in the process. OK, let's uh, let's get to some questions here. So, Senator, this is from Shay from New Smyrna Beach. I hope I said that right. From Smyrna Beach, Florida. Does the decline in masculinity in America increase gender confusion in kids? This is a great question. And does that lead to an increase in the likelihood of that individual trying to become trans? Your thoughts, Senator? You know, that's a great question. And I'm signing a book here as I as I, uh, I do this. So tell me, I've got it. S-H-E-A. So here we go. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the 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 trans ideology, I mean, I think definitely what you see from the left and Charlie, you and I have talked about this. I had this hilarious exchange. I write about it in the book a year ago with a professor from an elite law school, you know, highly regarded law school who came before the Senate and would not say the word woman. Yeah. Would not say woman. UC Berkeley, I think. UC Berkeley is correct. And so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to her and this is on a committee hearing on women's rights, may I, may I add. So finally, I said to her, it got to be my turn. I said, you know, you keep saying persons with capacity for pregnancy. Would that be women or what am I missing here? And she lectured me about how that was transphobic and that question led to violence. I mean, literally, people can, you can go look this up on the web. I mean, don't take my word for it. So I think what you see from the left is this ideology that is a religious ideology for them, that they have totally swallowed hook, line, and sinker. That, again, gender, there's no such thing as gender. That, in fact, there's something inherently oppressive about masculinity and femininity. And so that's one of the reasons I think that they they push to kids this idea that, you know, listen, you, you shouldn't, there is no such thing as gender. And that you need to be asked every five minutes, or do you still want to be a boy? Do you do you want to be a girl? You know, gender is a spectrum. You can be a hundred different things. It is profoundly disorienting to children. And uh, I, I think it's a huge, huge problem in, in schools and uh, something that the only way to fix it is to give parents control again, I think, over their kids' education. But yeah, I think it's a huge issue. Go to premiercollectibles.com slash manhood to get your copy. I was just flipping through it. It's incredibly deep. It's terrific. Trevor from California, what made you want to come out and release this book now? Similar to my question, but I think it's a good one. Like what what about this moment in time made you want to release this? Well, I think we're at such a critical moment. Listen, as as I talk to young men all around my state and around the country, as I have the privilege to, to travel, and then I've also I've taught young men, and I talk about this some in the book. I share some stories of young men that I taught. Uh, before I was uh, in in politics. I was a lawyer, a religious liberty lawyer, constitutional lawyer, and I also taught at law school for a while. And I, I, I taught a lot of young people out there, a lot of young men. And my sense of it is, is that we've really reached a crisis point with young men in particular. And Charlie, you referenced some of the stats, record high levels of depression, sure. record high levels of drug abuse, record high levels of suicide. It's bad for all men. It's really terrible for young men. And I just think that young men are saying, I, I, I need some I, I need some some vision of what my life can be. And my view is, is that, hey, listen, I don't I don't have the vision personally, but you know what? I think I know where I can find it. I think I can find it in the faith of our fathers. I think I can find it in what the scripture says. I think I can find it in the good stories from American history. And that's really why I wrote the book. Great. Uh, so let's get to the next question here. Uh, Shannon from Illinois. Senator, is there a main theme or takeaway you want your readers to gain? Uh, yeah, I would just say this, that. The, the message that I want to send to men is, we need you. Your families need you. Your country needs you. The world needs you. And you can be a tremendous force for good. I and mean, that's the bottom line of everything is that men don't, don't believe that because you're a man, if you, if you want to, if you want to be, uh, you know, want to live like a traditional man, traditional masculinity, that somehow that makes you evil. No. And don't buy the left's line that you need to be an androgynous consumer. No. You can be a tremendous force for good by giving of yourself, 
by taking on responsibility and by living in a sacrificial way. You, you can change the destiny of your life, your family, and this nation. That's the bottom line for me. Another great question here from Luke in Michigan. When do you think the decline in masculinity began in America? It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Um, oh, it's hard to pinpoint. I mean, I really think the left really, really ramped up their attack on, on manhood and womanhood, frankly, starting in the 60s. I mean, you really see it. That's when cultural Marxism, you know, this, this attack on everything that is permanent and true, this attack on God and faith, this attack on American history, cultural Marxism really took off in our universities in the 1960s. And then it really became mainstream in the Democrat Party over the last 20 years. So I think you can go back to the 60s and you start seeing the universities churn out this garbage about men being toxic, men being inherently destructive and oppressive. And then at the same time, you had the policymakers doing the stuff we were talking about a second ago, Charlie, which is sending our jobs overseas, hollowing out our industrial base, destroying blue collar jobs and communities in this country. And those two things coincided and it became kind of a perfect storm. And now we're in the midst of it. But hey, my message is we can reverse the storm. You know, I mean, we shouldn't just say, oh, all is lost. I mean, there's nothing we can do. No, 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 no. There are things we can do. We can call men to a higher vision and we can change the stupid policies that have so severely hurt this country. And we need to we need to get on it ASAP. James from Arkansas, great state, said, what led you to pursue a career in politics? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um you know, well, I was, as I was saying a second ago, my, my trainings as a lawyer, I was a constitutional lawyer um, and I ran. It's been, I guess, six years ago now, uh, five, six years ago, I ran for the first time uh, for office, um, had never been involved in politics before. And it was really just a sense that we were at a crisis point as a, as a nation and that I wanted to I wanted to defend the Constitution and I wanted to defend the principles that I thought this nation was built on. And I was trying to do that as a constitutional lawyer. That's actually why I became a constitutional lawyer. I wanted to fight for the principles I believe the country was built on. But I just came to a point, my wife and I together, we thought maybe we've been trying to do this in the courtroom. We've been trying to do this through lawsuits. Maybe we could do this by serving. I mean, maybe we can do this by trying to go out there and, and defend our laws, to, to have a voice in the public sphere, to shape public policy. So... Uh, that's why we did it. And I say we, because it was my wife, Aaron and I, it was a, it was a family decision. You know, we, we prayed about it. We thought about it and, um, here we are. Very good. Everyone get your book at premiercollectibles.com slash manhood. Scott from Indiana says, what challenge or charge do you give fathers specifically? Oh, Hey, that's a, that is a great one. I would just say that fathers, you being involved in your children's lives will make all the difference in their lives. And don't take my word for it. Look at what the numbers tell you. You being involved, you don't have to be perfect. You know, just set that aside. You don't have to be perfect. Just being there, caring about your son or daughter, telling them about, giving them a sense of why they matter and why they're important. That will change their health outcomes. That will change their educational outcomes. That will change their sense of self. That will completely reshape their future in terms of who they marry and the families they have, the presence of a father in their lives makes all the difference of the world. And I tell stories in the book about my grandfather, who was hugely significant in my life, my own father. So, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a personal example of this. I've seen it. I've seen that power of involvement, of, of loving presence. And, even, you know, I can just, again, as a father myself, like every day I try to get better as a father and every day I'm like, uh, ah, I screwed that up. You know, I need to do that better. It's never about that. It's never about perfection. It's always just about giving your best and being there. And that, you know what? That's enough. It really is. That is enough. And uh, it, it, it can make all the difference in a kid's life. Very good. Next question here. Taylor from North Carolina. What does our future look like if we continue to confuse the respective masculine and feminine roles and responsibilities. Taylor from North Carolina. Well, I think we're seeing it. I think we're seeing it in the left's assault on on gender. I mean, and look, listen, you, we talked about the, the manhood side of it. Look at the womanhood side. Look what the left is trying to do with having biological men play women's sports. I mean, it's it's crazy. Five years ago, could we have even had this discussion? And the premise of that is there's no such thing as a woman. Anybody can be a woman. A man wants to be a woman, fine. I, I decide today I am, and, and then I can go use the girls' locker room. So what will happen is what we're seeing. It's the acceleration of the destruction of places for women, of safe places for women. Uh, it's the destruction of responsible masculinity. 
so I, I think that we are we are in the early stages of what will happen. We'll just see it accelerate, and it will it will lead to increasing social breakdown. It'll lead to more youth crime, crime and violence, especially among young men. It'll lead to more violence against women, which is what we're seeing now, and that's why we've got to turn this around, and we can uh, by getting back to the fundamentals, getting back to the truth. So Rachel asks this question from Maryland. Senator, what does manhood specifically actually look like? Isn't it more than just stereotypical roles? You see, Senator, this is a question that is rooted in, uh, it's a good question because on colleges, they'll just say male and female is just archetypes. Anybody can assume it at any time. You can wear woman face or male face as you seek fit. So the question is, what does manhood actually look like? It is a great question, and I, I try to I try to explore that in the book. And here's the best way I, I know to answer it. Number one is that that being a man is a journey of character, and being a man involves acquiring the character of a husband and a father, of a builder and a warrior, of a priest and a king. And to me, that journey towards those virtues and taking on those roles is what it looks like to be a man, and that's a lifetime journey. A lifetime journey. One that, by the way, to, to, to go back to that question about fatherhood, one that a father can share with his sons and a grandfather can share with his son and grandsons. I mean, it, it becomes a, a project across the generations where we share together this journey to try to be all that God made us to be. But I think there are distinctively masculine, there's a distinctively masculine call as husband, father, builder, and warrior. Somebody should write, and it probably has Charlie a, a, a books on you know on womanhood and and what the core of that looks like. That's not that's out of my area of expertise, like far far and beyond. I, maybe my wife will do that. Your wife, yeah. But um, but I think for men, you know, the other piece of it is is that we want to we want to have things to do, right? Like what is it that we can do as men? And I think the answer is we grow in character into those roles, into those responsibilities, and ultimately into that way of service. And it gives you fulfillment in your life, something that is, is right. really missing. Calvin from Texas says, what advice would you give to a man, a young man who struggles with his manhood? Well, I think that this is where having role models, I think, is so critical. And this is one of the things that the left's assault on masculinity and manhood has really, really hurt. Is why it's been so destructive is they basically tried to destroy all the role models out there. The left's lies that American history is fundamentally racist and oppressive and bigoted, that's part of that, right? Trying to tear down all of the role models, all of the good men of our history. So I think that one of the best things that you can you can do as a man is say, okay, who, who do I admire as a man? What other good, strong men are there out there? And you try to emulate their virtues. You try to say, okay, look at his character. What kind of character did he have? And this is why in the book, I tell these different stories about people from the Bible. I tell different stories about men from my own life, coaches, uh, relatives, uncles, uh, people who have had a significant influence on me. But Charlie, the, the core of it is they just modeled for me something about what it meant to be a man. And every one of those stories I tell for me has been significant because I've said, OK, there's something to aim at. There's a model to look for. And I think young men, especially today, need those models. Very good. Okay, let's go to uh, Kenzie in Colorado. What do you think these conversations around? What do you? Where do you think these conversations around gender need to take place to actually enact change? Well, I mean, number one, they've got to take place at home, and this is why fathers are so significant. Men, this is why you listen. You want to change the world, men. Um, here's the most powerful thing you can do to change the world: get married and have a family. Right. I mean, yeah, I want you to, to get a great job, too, and be innovators and, and scientists and, and write great books and all that stuff. That's wonderful. But the most powerful thing you can do is to get married and have a family because it's there in the in the family with your own children, with your spouse, your wife, who you will be able to leave a legacy that will touch many, 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 many more lives. So, you know, where does this have to begin? It's got to begin at home. This is why men need to be involved, you know, and dads, I just say, you know, if you're out there and it's like, ah, oh, well, I've messed it up. Well, there's still time, you know, I mean, you can, you can put it right. You can try to make it right. You can try to, you can try to do better, right? I mean, there's always tomorrow. So I think it's a message of hope that men need to hear beyond that in school. You know, Charlie, I'm just, I'm worried about these school curriculum curricula, I guess I should say that uh, are shoved down our kids' throats from the time they're little, starts in kindergarten where the boys, and the data shows this, the boys are interrupted in their play far more often 
than girls. Boys are diagnosed with ADD or ADHD at rates far, 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 far beyond not only girls, but boys in other countries. Yep. So that They're kind trying of- trying to medicate our young men. Exactly. exactly. And that has got to stop. And so I think the home is critical. Beyond that, we've got to give parents some power again in these schools so that they can be advocates for their children, men and women, boys and girls. But for the boys, I think that looks like, hey, there's nothing wrong with being a boy, you know? And maybe we need to have some more phys ed and some more recesses in school and bring back the idea that, hey, you know what? It's okay to run and play. I know my boys, like, if you make them sit still for more than 20, 30 minutes, like, it's going to be a challenge. And that's not because they're bad boys. It's because they're boys. And yeah. so I, I think we've got to bring that back to our schools. Yeah, no, the, there's a great book. I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, it was one of the – I'll think of it in a second. She, she talked about how the entire education system is so feminine, right, from the books that we read, like Little House on the Prairie. And we have really feminized – American education, right? To how kids have to sit for a long period of time, to everything being conversational based, where young men are, you know, shorter attention spans, much more into doing, much more manual labor, care more about stories that are rooted in biography or adventure than um, than stories on romance or on dialogue, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's it, there was a great, you'll, you'll love this, Senator. There's a I'll never forget it. Dennis Prager told me this once. So Harvard did a study where they they uh, had 500 men and 500 women and they locked them in a room and they said, just stare at the wall and think about whatever you want to think about. OK, and then they, they, they come out and then they say, OK, what do you think about for the last 30 minutes for an hour? So the men thought about sports and sex. Those uh -huh. were the two things they thought about. Of course, this is fascinating. The women replayed conversations they had in their head. Isn't that fascinating? It's like completely that is fascinating. Different, right? Yeah. Where they were replaying previous conversations. Uh, it's just it, it, totally different, right? And it, the, the, in a good way, the distinctions are necessary. Totally. Yep. Um, but so so here's a question, Senator, and uh, we're, we're at, we, have, we have tons of questions. These don't have any names on them. But I, here's one that I, I will ask, which is, you know, y young men are less confident, you know, they're afraid in this sense where, for example, I, I had a young man once at an event saying, Charlie, I'm afraid to ask a woman on a date because I'm afraid of being accused of sexual harassment or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, that might be an unfounded fear, but it does say something, Senator. Don't we as the adults need to come in and really kind of get rid of this political correctness? Because, yes, there's clumsiness and nonsense. But, I mean, for them to say that, you know, there's a campus rape problem, they way overdid that, Right. And I think the the issue was this guilty until proven innocent. We saw it with Kavanaugh and the overdoing of Me Too. How much did all those movements possibly play into kind of the, the weakening of the American male? Well, I think when you send, I would put it this way. I think when you relentlessly for decades now tell men that character traits like aggressiveness and adventurousness and boisterousness and everything that we associate not just not just we like right now, everything for millennia, right? We've associated with men. When you tell them constantly that those traits lead to oppression and bigotry and injustice and, and climate change, let's throw that one in there because they say that all the time too. Men are the drivers of climate change, right? The climate crisis. When you say that stuff over and over, I think that for young men in particular, you, you, you totally bewilder and disorient them where they're like, well, okay, well, wait a minute. So I'm not supposed to do any of those things, huh? Well, then what what am I supposed to do? You know, what am I maybe? I'm, and this is where they just like, oh, maybe I just am supposed to then I guess sit around and be entertained. The problem is, Charlie, as we talked about earlier, for those men who are living in mom and dad's basement and just sitting on the computer watching their screen, they don't feel good about their lives. You can see that in the data. They don't feel good about it. So on the one hand, you disorient the men and you say, no, don't don't do what, what men from time immemorial have been thought to do and encouraged to do. Don't go out there and take the initiative. Don't try to be a leader. No, don't do that. But then if, if you just do what the left wants you to do, which is nothing, then people feel terrible about their lives and they feel like they have no purpose. And that's because they don't. So I think you we put young men in this situation where culturally they're totally bewildered and confused. And then you you layer on top of this. And I, I thought what you were going to say about the young man who talked to you is that he was afraid to get rejected. I think there's this also now. Well, that's also true. Yes. Oh, yeah. This also this powerful and profound fear of among young men and young people that they've got to be perfect, you know, and our so-called meritocracy 
on these university campuses feeds into that, where we tell them you're defined by your SAT score. You're defined by your GPA. You're defined by what, what diploma you get from the right school. And if you can't have those things, you're really not worth much in life. We, we, I say we, the culture, the elite culture sends that message. And so I think that a lot of times young men are really, they're afraid to fail. They're tell, afraid to take a risk because it's like, oh, what if this doesn't go well? What if I fail? Whereas I think in prior generations, it's like, hey, failure is part of being a man, right? You take a risk. It's kind of like you, you climb the tree, you fall out of it, you get back in it, right? And so I think for young men, sending them the message that it's good to be a man, it's it's good to pick good role models who show you what a strong, responsible man is. It's good to go after that and do, and to do it hard, to do it all your life. That's the kind of thing we need. That's the message we need. So let's talk for a second. And I know you talk about this in the book about delayed gratification, right? Yeah. So, you know... You came out, I think, at one of our events and spoke negatively against pornography and the yeah. whole world oh, lost yeah. their mind. Yes, right? the left melted down. Because the left has some, I, I mean, it's like pro-pornography or something. I mean, it's yes, a totally. okay? And, you know, I, I spoke openly on the show. Almost every young man, myself included, had their struggle with it at some point. Praise God, you can overcome it. So it's not like some moralist thing from my perspective, right? It's something that's very real, incredibly chemically addictive and should not be celebrated, Right. Yeah. So there's not like a, I'm a better than you type thing, but I could say that it's unbelievably damaging to the brain, to the soul, to the psyche, to confidence. And so let's talk about that issue in particular. Yeah. Pornography. I think it's one of the great arsenics of American manhood. Do you agree? Yeah. Oh, totally. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it is, it is really amazing, Charlie, that anytime you even bring it up, the left automatically loses their minds. I'm sure right now as we're talking, someone on Twitter or many someones are just completely losing it because we've dared to be even somewhat critical. So no, I, I think that this is part of the deadening effect. I mean, it, it's just, again, just look at the data. You don't have to take our words for it. Go look at the numbers. It shows Jerry that. Wilson's book, Your Brain on Porn. I mean, I don't know if you know about it. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's unbelievable. It's the yeah, best. Exactly. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the more time that men spend on their screens, looking at porn, being entertained, the less time they spend with in real relationships and learning to ask real women out on dates, forming relationships, getting married. You know, and I mean, the, the correlation between delay in marriage and family formation and huge consumption of pornography is there in the literature. This has been much studied. It's not like this is like some new thing where, oh, I've never heard of it. It's like this has been studied many times. The data is out there. And you're exactly right about this. Isn't about a moralistic, like you know, oh, I'm better than you. Not at all. I mean, I not, acknowledge not I'm not at actually. all. It's just, I'm trying to warn you, it's bad. <laughs> it's yeah. It's all about like, hey, what can you do to be the person who you were created to be? What can what steps can you take towards that? And I think we need to say to young men in particular, like, listen, turn off the porn and go ask a real woman on a date. I mean, you know, yes. what's going to be better for your life? Yeah, and it's just so that that's an interesting thing, right? So men men need to be intentional about about saying no to things that might give you immediate gratification that's right, right. and it's not just pornography but it could be video games it could be the screens but yeah. also let's let's talk for a second senator you know you're you're definitely one of the more athletic probably the most the fittest u.s senator i mean some senators <laughs> I don't know. I won't say any names you know the guy from montana he's he's not exactly fit steve danes is the other guy john tester but i mean let's talk about it men should care about their body shouldn't they i mean is, is that part of this well i i do think that for i mean just for me um having some it's about, about self-discipline and having yes. a routine having a schedule where it's Tell like me yeah, about your routine no because you're you're i mean look everywhere you go there's probably donuts and there's probably <laughs> salt no i mean but you you're a very fit no Which but I tell us i just think that so I, some stories i tell in the book I, I i end up telling a couple stories about coaches that i had and it's funny charlie i didn't like when i was thinking about the book i didn't like script out these stories and i did not intend to tell any personal stories i really didn't it's just that as i was writing and then trying to think about, okay, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm preaching this, so to speak, like, how has this been real in my own life? And as I went through that process and was writing about it, I found myself, you know, telling sto personal stories from my life about how a particular thing had come home to me. So on this point, some of the biggest influences in my life were my coaches and early on, you know, it's starting in junior high and then certainly in high school and, and just helping me, they gave me a sense of uh, vision for my life. They believed that, you know, I could be a better athlete. They could, believed I could be a better man. And they helped me learn 
self-discipline. And for me, playing sports was about, yeah, being on a team that was amazing, being part of, of something bigger than myself, but also self-discipline. And I love that aspect of it. And I've tried to keep that up in my life, you know, to have the discipline to, to get up, you know, in the morning. And to, for me, I start my day, I spend time in prayer and I read the Bible and then I try to exercise. And, you know, and so I'm with my own boys now, you know, I, I want them to see that, hey, a life of self-discipline, it can look very different, right? It's different for every person. Yeah. But, but I think so there's yeah, go ahead. No, no, I just started to interject. I think this yeah. is great because well, tell us your routine. Tell, because because your disciplines are a reflection of your values, right? If yeah. you make it a routine, the habits then point to your destiny. So walk us through because people are fascinated by this. I mean, you're a U.S. senator. You're on committees and all this, but you have time to work out. So to walk us through that, I think it's really interesting. Well, I, I try to get up uh, – pretty early in the morning. And then for me, you know, I, I, I try to spend, I, I try to give my first, the, the first fruits of my day, so to speak, you know, that, that first quality time, I, I try to give that to God because for me, my faith, I'm a Christian, my faith is at the center of what I do. So the, the and I, for me, I got to do it immediately because if I say, oh, I'll try to do it later in the day, like I, I just, I lose control of my day, Charlie. And then also I, I, you know, my kids, my wife. So I get up, I try to, to spend some time uh, by myself, reading the Bible and praying. I do that first. Um, then uh, I try to exercise. I try to do that before work, if at all possible, because again, that, that allows me then to focus on the whole rest of the day. Um, go to work, do that hard, go after it. And then when I get home, I try to, Charlie, when I get home and I try to get home in time to have dinner with my family, which means I say no to most evening events. So if I'm if you're out there and I've said no to your event, don't take it personally. It's because I've got little kids at home. Wow. And my wife. And to me, I'm a husband and a father first. And so most evening events, I don't do those in D.C. Um, I go home. I go see my wife and my kids. I try to eat dinner with them. And then I put my boys to bed and I, re I usually read them. I talk about this in the book. I read them a story typically and we pray together. And then that gives us usually if, we, if all goes according to plan, which, you know, it rarely does. But then my wife and I will have some time in the evening or I'll put our little baby down to bed and we'll have then, you know, 45 minutes or so to ourselves where we can catch up and spend that time together. And so that's kind of the structure of my day. And um, it just for me, it's about trying to prioritize those things that I think are most important. Um, my faith, my wife, my kids. And uh, that to me allows me to do the job that I'm called to do. So, I mean, I don't know how far you want to get into this. Or it, let, let me just want to focus on the physical aspect of it, yeah. which you obviously take, you know, importance. We are we are a body. It's not the most important part of us. The soul is the most important, and we are a mind as well. You know, young men are more overweight, less athletic. I mean, you talk about take you know turn off the screen. But Teddy Roosevelt, you talked about he famously used to have cabinet officials come while he was hunting or doing two hours of exercise on the White House lawn. I mean, the guy was a beast, right? Yeah. I mean, he was a super active person. And men are more likely to want to be involved in physical activity, doing things with their hands. And so do you have any comments on that in general? Just like at least prioritizing the physical in some way. It's not the most important thing. It could become an idol 100 percent. But your body is a temple, as the scriptures say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a definite cor a correlation between disciplining your body and disciplining your mind and your character. Right. I mean, that's why it's good. If yes. you have discipline in one part of your life, it's easier to carry that over into other parts of your life. So that's why, you know, I mean, getting some exercise, uh, disciplining yourself with what you eat. I mean, everybody's got to do this according to their own goals. But for me, I just find that that is helpful in maintaining a focus and being goal oriented. I also happen to enjoy it. I mean, for me, like I, I get energy out of it. It helps me focus more. I have more energy throughout the day yeah, if no, I've I begun agree. with a discipline in the morning. Yeah. And that's, I mean, discipline's become a dirty word, but again, it's a reflection of our, of your values. So Senator, anything in closing here, I, there's other questions. They're not attributed any names. So I don't know. I don't think, I think we got through all the names to be signed, but any other closing thoughts on this? Everyone, you can get your book, premiercollectibles.com slash manhood. Any closing thoughts as we, as we wrap this up? I would just say that, that to the men out there, boy, uh, this is, we need you. America needs you. Your families need you. And this is your time. I mean, this is your time to step up and to change the destiny of your life, the destiny of your family and of this nation. If ever there was a time where we needed strong men and good men in this country. This is it right now. And that's one of the reasons, Charlie, I'm excited to be alive in this time and excited to see what the men of this generation are going to do. Yeah. Amen. We, we need a, a new generation and everyone could check out the book manhood, the masculine virtues America needs by Josh Hawley. I highly recommend it. Senator, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you. Thank you. Check out premiercollectibles.com slash manhood, get your signed copy at the link above and thanks so much. Thank you, Charlie.
Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.